<laughs> Howdy, crumb bums! It's time for another episode of Conically Crumb! Oops! I mean, Canonically Crumb. The only show that examines the comics and characters of the Crummyverse. Couple of pieces of housekeeping at the top of the show, folks. I noticed an egregious typo in the warning at the start of uh, all the episodes. Uh, now, it should say canonically crumb, not conically crumb. This isn't a show about geometric forms, folks. Uh, I don't know. What can I say? I'm a one-man show, uh, and you look at something so many times, you just can't see it anymore. Uh, I will try to do better in the future. Uh, this isn't an apology per se, but it's an assurance that I am significantly embarrassed and uh, crumb bums feel free to mock me mercilessly in the comments below. One more piece of news. On Friday, I was on Flippin' Through, the number one Mad Magazine news, news reviews, reviews, and Charleston Chews channel with Patrick and award-nominated cartoonist Noah Van Skyver. I seem to recall it went something like this. Dude, I would love to come on your channel. I could talk about Chrome forever. Sure, yeah. So yeah, much. yeah, you should come on uh, talk about Chrome. So, I am going to try to set something up with Noah, uh, but more broadly, uh, talking to people is definitely something I want to do on this show. So if you're a cartoonist, if you're a publisher, uh, if you worked with Crumb, if you're some kind of ivory tower expert, if you hate Crumb and you can articulate why, leave a count comment on here or message me on Instagram or send me an email at kyle at kylebridget.com. I want to hear from you, especially if you're famous. Well, Crumb Bums, without further ado, let's truck on down to Detroit City. That's right, it's Motown, baby, because today we're talking about... Boingy Baxter. Yeah. As always, we need to acknowledge that for our purposes, Robert Crumb's canon includes The Big Yum Yum Book, The Complete Crumb, The Weirdo Years, Zap, Hup, Mystic Funnies, and A Bit of Dirty Laundry. Boingy Baxter first leaped from the pages of Motor City Comics number one in 1969. Crumb spent some time in Motor City in the 1960s, and really Detroit deserves its own canonically Crumb episode at some point. We begin with this strange perspective shot. The inimitable Boingy Baxter, looking rather flat here, boings at the reader, accompanied by a self-quote from R. Crumb. Detroit is a real panic. Feels a bit like a Jimmy Durante line. Ha-cha-cha-cha-cha. This even more pint-sized George E. Stone character looks like a cheap gangster out of central casting. He's complete with the wide-shouldered, double-breasted pinstripe suit fedora, and pencil mustache combo, save for one critical distinction, the source of his power, his spring-loaded shoes. In a Runyon-esque accent, Baxter says, this is in the realm of great achievements. Down on the ground, the people gather to admire this most amazing guy. I'm partial to the beatnik boppin. Man, that dude is airborne. And this solid citizen who thinks, better watch out, boingy. The narration says, one day, Boingy's wife was after him with the Thorazine again. She's obviously trying to ground him. But even if Motown is Trank City, Boingy says, Oh no you don't, you bitch! And bounces away mucho pronto, right into the arms of his wife's best friend. She keeps Boingy for three weeks, feeding him a steady diet of cake and chicken soup. The stationary lifestyle catches up with Boingy fast, and he packs on the pounds. As he begins to realize that he's trapped in a gilded cage, Boingy's wife's best friend drops the bomb. She's pregnant. Boingy tries to bounce, but her diabolical plan works. It looks like Boingy is captured, having exceeded the weight restrictions of his spring shoes, and he may have to raise his own child. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door, and she steps over Boingy to answer it. It's the police, the FBI, the CIA, and the IRS. It seems they've tracked Milton, alias Boingy Baxter, to her trailer. 
The prospect of prison is a strong motivator for Boingy, and he somehow manages to shed the pounds and evade arrest. However, he's still not safe, as apparently the methods of these agencies have become ever more sophisticated. Amongst dramatic gunfire, Boingy manages to escape to international waters. And now it's time for a little of the old-fashioned racism, as Boingy bounces his way to China, where the buildings have pagoda flourishes and everyone dresses in the Manchurian fashion. Boingy asks a local for directions to the nearest beanery. Sitting down, he asks for chicken flied lice, which is a racist joke favored by grandfathers everywhere. But as it turns out, Boingy is actually in a dentist's chair and he springs into action saying, oh no you don't, you gooks, and I use crest, you commie rats. Now, last episode when the Rough Tough Cream Puff used the term gook, I looked it up in Cassell's Dictionary of Slang and demonstrated how, in that particular context, the term wasn't explicitly racist. Well, you can crumple up that explanation and toss it in the ash can this time, folks, because Crumb is just blatantly doing a racism here. I just want to take a moment to remind everyone that we've come a long way in our understanding of anti-Asian racism and the ways in which it's manifested historically in the culture. The publication of Motor City Comics number one is more than twice as far from today than it is from the raw, raw, patriotic, anti-Japanese racism of World War II, and nearly a decade before Edward Said would publish his seminal work, Orientalism. Openly racist depictions of Asians was totally commonplace until at least the 90s. And frankly, it still kind of is. <laughs> Myself, I grew up reading The Five Chinese Brothers, and granted it was published in 1938, it was still listed as one of the teacher's top 100 books for children in a National Educators Association poll as recently as 2007. And none of this is to excuse Crum here especially since he clearly goes beyond the ambient background anti-Chinese racism at the time of publication. But every conscientious crumb bum has to grapple with these kind of depictions in the canon and decide for themselves, on a comic-to-comic -comic basis, to what degree Crum is transgressing against social attitudes of bigotry, and how much is just him expressing his own personal racism because this certainly isn't the last time that we'll encounter anti-Chinese racism in the Crummyverse. After narrowly avoiding an aerial assault, Boingy ponders his next move. Seems there's no place left for a spring-loaded hayseed these days, but he thinks maybe he'll try out Argentina. Two weeks later, things seem to be looking up for old Milton, but as he flirts with this hot little Argentinian floozy, instead he finds his better half incognito and the Thorazine shot that finally catches up with the inimitable Boingy Baxter. As she carries him away, Boingy remarks, I think my old lady is an undercover agent. So that's Boingy Baxter, and he's about as close as Crumb will get to a superhero character until the mighty power fems in Hup number two almost 20 years later. Basically the Nietzschean ubermensch, Boingy is unbound by earthly morality through pure force of will and some ingenious gadgetry, he's able to escape the dreary blue-collar banality of the average lumpen denizens of Motor City. Nothing can touch this guy. He's literally above responsibility. But in reality, he's just a ridiculous man-child with cool shoes who selfishly shirks his obligations, breaks the law, and is prone to lust, sloth, and gluttony. But he gets away with it, and that's why he's a hero to the people. Like other beloved American outlaws, Pretty Boy Floyd, John Dillinger, Jesse James, and Dick Little, it's the legend of Boingy that people love. I mean, who can't relate to the feeling of just running away from your problems? And who hasn't fantasized about casual sex without a relationship? Boingy Baxter is the symbol of that dream realized. And fear not crumbums, because Boingy returns in XYZ Comics in 1972. In Women Troubles, we find Boingy Baxter, a little older, a little wiser, but he's still got that Boingy magic. After arriving in Bayboig after a long absence, Baxter's reputation precedes him as adoring fans gather for a chance to glimpse one of his famous giant leaps. 
where Boingy tells him that he only do dat stuff in an emergency these days. The crowd doesn't have to wait long, as some of Boingy's ex-girlfriends soon catch up with him. This prompts Boingy to make one of his patented escapes. <laughs> it's comforting to know that Boingy Baxter is out there someplace, getting laid and enjoying a free lunch and bouncing checks and skipping out on alimony payments for the rest of us average slobs. Well, crumb bums, we've come to the end of another episode of Canonically Crumb. If you've enjoyed this show, make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, be a ding dong daddy, and ding that bell. I'm your host, Kyle Bridget. You can find my links in the show description and join me in the Nostril Zone, where we listen to tunes and draw cartoons every Sunday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Central Time. And if you want to support this program and myself, you will also find my Patreon in the show description as well. Canonically Crumb will be back as weekly as possible with another deep dive into the Crummyverse. Thanks again, Crumb Bums, and keep on... Judlin? Step aside. Jump, jump here, step aside. Jump, jump here, let's hear today. Jumps on this way, step aside. Step aside. Jump, jump here.